was the more rational thing to do. However, it turned it to uh, you know to be the, the wrong decision. So the marginal um, mentality was actually the more logical mentality. So this becomes apparent. You know, it's obvious. You know that you do what is necessary, irrespective of what others seem to think, or ex what others express themselves as. Because usually people don't think when they express themselves. They just repeat what they've heard previously. And they don't know why. Generally, you develop a very critical attitude towards anything and everything. Very, very critical. Which is very difficult, you know, in terms of interpersonal relationships. You know, because you become very critical of other people around you, too. Like, I was always very critical of Say Lee to, to, to an extent that was very disturbing as well. Yeah. And, uh, but I did absorb this uh, criticism myself, and that's, that's one thing that uh, was, as he says, you know, it's so difficult to find someone who's themselves ready to accept this criticism and does this criticism themselves. And my relations with my friends, look, I, if I want them to work, I can't permit myself mm -hmm. to be actually who I am because I like to, mm -hmm. you know, go through all this criticism. So you have to stop yourself and put limits on what you can say For or them, what you want to examine. Yes, I, I. For example, the other day at work, I, I, this usual client that I work with. Uh, is uh, she she's quite open-minded you know she does all these trips and all that and I, so I figured you know maybe I can talk to her and at the end of the conversation she just finished like she didn't want to listen to anything mm -hmm. so just talking about my culture she she can she talk. evacuated it she couldn't hear yeah. yeah it's usually I find the same you know when I try to explain how what it is to uh, to live in a survivor family, to, c to come from a survivor family, or to, to make it through the Holocaust and all that sort of thing. Generally, uh, people uh, are polite and will tolerate me for a while and remain silent and will not express an opinion on the matter, as if it doesn't really concern them and uh, they only are listening because they feel obliged that uh, they should listen. But they don't feel obliged to indicate their either support or non-support, which by definition they are hiding. So the silence is basically a cloak of guilt that people assume because they don't want to uh, recognize the guilt in the matter and the responsibility of basically nearly the entire world mm -hmm. in uh, the Holocaust. It wasn't just the Nazi affair, there was fascist movements everywhere in the world that were condoning and promoting this and uh, others who uh, acceded to the fascist mentality, perhaps not by supporting a fascist regime in their own country, or not by being a collaborator necessarily, but certainly by not aiding those who are in need, like the uh, refugees. So... I mean, in that sense, you talking today about your stories and allowing us to record them and leave them and have them archived, this is material that will be aired. There will be students now in classes, unlike when you were both in school, that will hear these stories. These are our Montreal stories, and they will yes. be told. They'll yes. be told on radio, they'll be told in classes. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a permission, mm -hmm. there is an interest for these stories to be, to be talked about, and a tolerance to hear, as you're saying, that mm -hmm. politely turning away, there has been time accorded mm -hmm. to understanding why mm -hmm. we all become more human when we hear and when we tell our stories. Yes. However, it's limited. Um, perhaps another time we can speak about this further, but, you know, the disillusionment with religion 
led to further disillusionment, you know, with the existing political regime, the regimes, in plural, and with existing political ideologies of all sort. Now, once you get to that point, then you are meeting with resistance and blockages that refuse to hear any political critique that underlied the occurrence of the Holocaust itself. And uh, this is still not tolerated, neither in uh, you know, um, general Canadian society, the ideological critique of politics in general, and neither in the uh, Canadian Jewish community when it comes to an uh, ideological critique of prevailing political opinion, uh, especially when it comes to Israel. This is still very repressed. And this is why I became a co-founder of the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians. But uh, the critique of uh, existing political uh, ideology is, uh, is a subject, you know, for, for another yes. time, you know. It sort of deserves, you know, like a serious treatment. I think so. And also to make the link, you know, we've, we've sort of followed and progressed uh, from some of your early years and obviously there's a whole many other years where your own thoughts and experience would have led up to your own current beliefs and uh, experiences so yes um, and i found it necessary to actually codify it you know mm -hmm. in serious scholarship you know by writing my doctoral thesis uh, on this the title is nation society and the state the reconciliation of uh, palestinian and jewish nationhood is the title and subtitle of my thesis and uh, I go back into the origins of uh, the Holocaust in European political thought by doing critique of Hegel and Hegel's uh, concept of the nation state. And uh, which was a hard period for him also. Yeah, I was for dying. I was in the process of dying when I was writing that. Because this has been a long, this is not just a few years you're talking no, about. No, I, I was only able to do it on a part-time basis. It took me eight years, you know, to, to complete the doctoral thesis. And during which time I was single parent, you know, taking care of Saley as well. So it's... Uh, There's many stories to tell in, yeah. those, uh, in those years. Thank you very much. Okay, so mir bringi, mir begrüßen, ei mit der Herzigen Baruch Haba. Ah, this is Yiddish <laughs> and Hebrew. Um, you're saying that uh, you are welcoming the audience to, uh, with a heartfelt feeling of, uh, of, of, of warm reception. In effect, that's what... Thank you. <laughs> and it's all true. And so uh, we welcome you again here today. Abraham A.B. Weisfeld. Yes. Um, I should say something in Yiddish because uh, there's not much left of Yiddish, especially Warsaw Yiddish, which is my, uh, my own dialect, which I learned from my mother, and which is actually my first language. In Yiddish, it's uh, said that uh, this is uh, just uh, 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 that I'm uh, a Mamaloshin, that my first language is Yiddish. Uh, and this is Emes. My first language is Yiddish. And I'm a Sabbish Yiddish. Not a Canadian Yiddish. Not a American Yiddish. As I didn't learn the best yet in the school. My Emes is a Sabbish Yiddish. Uh, in Warsaw, in Yiddish, we are on another way. We are on things that we can English. We in English. As I have to say, we are on all the refugees. The things that we are in the world, we are not going to be I was saying that uh, in the association of uh, survivors, the refugee survivors, we would speak in Yiddish all the time. And uh, it was sort of a, a more, there was much more liberty to speak in Yiddish than otherwise, because we were able to say things in Yiddish that were not allowed to be said in English. Uh, this is the uh, 
the Warsaw Lodge Mutual Benefit Association for the survivors of Warsaw and Lodz, the city just outside of Warsaw. And we were united because the, uh, all the residents in the Lodz ghetto were eventually uh, uh, placed in the Warsaw ghetto after the Warsaw ghetto was being emptied and the, and the inhabitants were being deported to the death camps. And so they integrated the two ghettos and so they became uh, a common association amongst the survivors because they, they were living together in the same ghetto in Warsaw afterwards in any case. And these are the membership cards for my parents. And uh, I was speaking with the president uh, of the Warsaw Lodge Mutual Benefit Association and he invited me to become president because he's getting rather old. But since I'm living in Montreal and not in Toronto, they only have members in Toronto, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't become accepted. president. Yeah, I couldn't be accepted. So that's, um, that's you know, what happened amongst the refugees. But I have some pictures here that I'd like to make a reference to uh, of life in Warsaw before the war. And uh, here we have, uh, here we have a picture. Let's start off with my mother. This is a picture of my <coughs> mother before the war when she was about 28 years old, a young beauty. Her name? Uh, in which language? <laughs> in English, her name is Sylvia. In, uh, in Yiddish, her name was Tsesha. But uh, I never called her... You called her mom. <laughs> ...by her name, yeah. <laughs> so, and then she brought, she kept photos of her friends as well uh, from Warsaw. Uh, here's, here's another beauty one of her friends, and... Uh, These are friends who survived, or we don't know? No, they didn't survive. No. She was never, you know, there was never any contact with them after the war. No. And then here's a picture of uh, my mother with three friends in the uh, park, which is like a, a very well-kept forest in Warsaw as well this one. And uh, there's digital copies of uh, all of these photos that uh, are available. And then there's uh, that's after the war. Oh yes, here's some more pictures. Here's uh, Oh yes, this is uh, Wanda, Ver Wanda Vesovska, who was a cousin of my mother, who survived actually, and she became, she was a um, reporter in the state news service working in Warsaw for the Communist Party. She became communist after the war. And then she left Poland, disillusioned. Her daughter married an American who went to live in the United States. So she came over to visit and stay with her daughter's family. And she passed through Toronto and I met her. She didn't speak any English, so we spoke in Yiddish. And, uh, and then I, t I told her what my own political uh, inclinations were. And when I told her, she virtually jumped out of her chair. You know, because, because where she came from in Poland, you know, under the uh, communist dictatorship, it was forbidden to talk about such things. So that's fun. Though. Then, here's another uh, friend, young friend. And then there's, uh, here's a family. There's some information on back here, but this is all that's left probably of this family, is this photo here writing and then here's a and here's another family and then here's another friend so here's a collection mm -hmm. of friends from Warsaw before the war all that your mother had taken with her yes mm -hmm. and uh, 
when my, um, my mother um, escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto, it was because her brother had escaped on his own beforehand and uh, found a, a site in Russia, in the forest in Russia, as a refuge. And he sent a message back to my mother uh, telling her that uh, it's possible to, to gain entry into Russia and escape from uh, Nazi-occupied territory in Poland in 1939. So she herself uh, jumped over the wall, uh, made her way through uh, Warsaw th and, through the, um, tr and got onto the train and hid on the train because she couldn't buy a ticket because she didn't have, you know, the proper identification, you know, because you needed to have, you know, a, a Christian identification in order to get a ticket on the train. So she hid under a bench in a train, and then she got as close to the border as possible. Then she walked across the border and made it to where, you know, she was directed by her brother, who's here in this picture. And then she came back to the Warsaw Ghetto, with messages for the resistance, for this underground railway, and uh, got her sister to come with her when she escaped the second time. And uh, this is the uh, reunion picture of uh, when she made it back with her sister who's in the center here, who's being featured in the center here. And uh, my mother was here next to her brother, Meyer, Meyer Goldscheider. And uh, this is the uh, photo of the, of the group, which was Bundist based. It was uh, the Jewish Bund uh, was the uh, Yiddish uh, culture, Yiddishkeit cultural uh, workers um, uh, organization, which was socialist but not communist. And in fact, the Jewish Bund was expelled by the joint votes of Lenin's group and the Mensheviks in the Russian Social Democratic Party in 1903. And they were expelled because they um, refused to assimilate into the general working class, you know, workers' formations. But since they were living under apartheid-like conditions in which Jews weren't allowed to work in the same places as the non-Jews in any case, so the Jews had their own unions by default. I mean, it was a bit ridiculous, you know, to expect that the Jewish workers would be integrated, you know, with, uh, with the non-Jewish workers' organizations and... Uh, and uh, to oblige them to have, you know, the same, uh, you know, uh, unions, in effect, you know, was demand by the regular Marxist, you know, tendencies of Lenin and uh, Kerensky to assimilate and uh, and sort of dissolve their own organizations, which were Jewish by default. So they couldn't do that, and they didn't do that, and so they were expelled in 1903. And then afterwards, Lenin was left with a majority, and that's why they were called the Bolsheviks, and the, and the Kerensky supporters were called the Mensheviks, which was, means minority tendency. And Bolshevik means majority tendency. So that's how Lenin took control over the Russian Social Democratic Party, and that's the beginning, really, of the dictatorship that was followed in the, the Soviet Union. And it all began with the expulsion of the Jewish Bundes movement, and, and these people. <laughs> So, you know, history and, and, and family sort of are very closely intertwined here. So that was the Bundeskrieg. And then uh, in 1940, when the Nazis invaded Russia, uh, Meyer, he formed a partisan group which fought as guerrilla warfare in the forest in Russia against the Nazi invasion of Russia. And, uh, and ironically, um, the Nazis referred to the, um, the Bundes partisan group that was, you know, uh, fighting in guerrilla war against the Nazi invasion of Russia. They were called by the Nazis terrorists. This is like the beginning of, of, the, of the word, use of the word terrorism. So it's so ironic now that, that the word is being used in, uh, in so many different uh, contexts. Now, there's, those are the pictures, and here we have, yes, this is um, my mother was a very resilient and resourceful person, and she contacted, she got contact with a German lawyer, and filed a suit against the state of Germany for a refugee's pension because um, 
uh, a lot of refugees who were in the West received a pension from the German state as Wittegutmachen, uh, which means uh, compensation for having been um, interned in a death camp or in a labor camp or in a, uh, in a um, munitions factory uh, as slave labor, basically. And uh, those uh, refugees were, had uh, a pension that was negotiated for them by the World Restitution Board of the Jewish, uh, of the Jewish society, Jewish civil society. But for those refugees who had escaped and hadn't been placed in a death camp, etc., they weren't automatically granted, you know, any pension. So my mother was actually one of the first to file for such a pension. And although it took 30 years, she finally got a pension and she had, you know, something to retire with. Uh, and these are the uh, receipts from the uh, pensions that she received from the state of Germany. Here's one for $548 a month. And here's a previous one for $357.73 Canadian. And you had the letter as well, I think, the original uh, German letter. Yes. When they finally acknowledged that they would. Yes, here, uh, here is, uh, here is the, uh, a letter from the, uh, the German lawyer who uh, let my mother know just, you know, what progress was being made in the suit. And this is... Uh, a certificate of identity in lieu of a passport because as a refugee of course they didn't have any passport so when they were in the refugee camp in Germany the American military uh, governor issued this identity paper but then they've been married because they're together here on the yes paper. yeah they got married in the refugee camp they met at the refugee camp and they were very similar I think that's why they sort of you know got together is because my father he escaped on his own from the refugee camp in Lublin, got into Russia, then came back and got his younger brother out and saved him from being uh, a collaborator, really, because he had been recruited into the uh, Jewish police, ghetto police, by the Nazi uh, occupation forces and uh, took him away. So he went, uh, you know, he deserted from the military police and, uh, and he saved his life. And then his brother formed another family, which is much larger than my own. So he and uh, Toby, who was the first Jewish refugee to uh, enter into Canada in 1947, um, from the first refugee boat that came from Europe, it was Toby and then, I don't know what her ma maiden name was actually, but uh, um, she married, uh, uh, Harry Weisfeld, and so she became Toby Weisfeld. And uh, this was also in Toronto. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then this is another. This is a German document with a German stamp, and for some reason a, a stamp of of Israel, or is it Palestine? It doesn't say Israel on it, Let's but it has it. Hebrew lettering mm -hmm. and uh, German. Uh, Lettering. The year 1947. Yes, this is a 1947 document. This was issued by the uh, German authorities for, as an identity paper for my parents in the uh, refugee camp. And then the Canadian citizenship paper. So it sort of uh, completes that. And this is, this is what? This is, this is, oh yes. This is where I registered my parents' names in the uh, National Registry of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. And this is my mother's uh, uh, testimonial as to uh, what happened to her and her family. She recorded this on her own? She just wrote her own? Uh, she wrote this, yes. This is, oh no, no, no. This is another person. This is Sam Weisfeld in uh, Florida. Oh yes, this is sent from a, another Weisfeld family in Detroit. Oh, I'm trying to make contact oh, yes. with you? Or? Yes, I made contact with them by the internet. Mm -hmm. And they are from the um, Hungarian part of the family that immigrated from Russia. Two brothers, four brothers, immigrated from Russia 
uh, on the, in the 19th century to both Poland and Hungary and then the, there was a separation of the family into those two branches and uh, I made contact with the second branch there. And then here I've tried to make a family tree of, of sorts, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's very complicated and it's only uh, sort of a matter of relying upon the memory of my mother mm. to determine how many people there actually were in the family. But uh, it seems like there was about 200 members of the family in Warsaw, 200 members of my father's family in, uh, in Lublin. And uh, of those 400, there were four survivors. This is a, um, a statement that was dictated by my mother to a, one of the helpers in the Baycrest uh, Home for the Aged. And uh, this gives some further information about my, my mother's family in Russia, uh, in, uh, po in Poland, in Warsaw. Yes, and then... There's the name of Meyer Goldscheider, her brother, who was the partisan, who formed the, uh, the Bundes partisan group, the terrorists, so-called. And then he was later conscripted into the Red Army, and then he was lost. And it's, uh, it's not known if he was lost uh, because of uh, combat with the uh, Nazi army, the Nazi-led army of Germany, or he could have been executed even by the Stalinist uh, police authorities, you know, for having been a Bundist, you know. I've tried to find out, you know, from the tracing service of the Red Cross and from, uh, from the Red Army archives, uh, which were supposed to be accessed by the Red Cross as well, but I have no response as to what its fate was. Because the Jewish Bundist uh, leadership was arrested, and as uh, Heinrich Erlich and Victor Alter, who were the two leaders of the Jewish Bund, who were called to a meeting by Stalin, who were arrested at the meeting, imprisoned, and interrogated. And Ehrlich, he was um, interrogated to the point that he was asked to write a history of the interwar history of the uh, Jewish Bund movement, of which he was a leader. And he wrote 273 pages of history in Yiddish, and it's in the NKVD archive in Moscow right now, and it's never been translated. And I'm engaged in a project with the Pluto Publishers in London to translate and publish, you know, this uh, history, this journal of Ehrlich. And soon after that, he was executed by the Stalinist uh, regime. And Alter, he survived for a period longer in the uh, in prison there in uh, Stalinist Russia. And after a few more years, uh, uh, he committed suicide. So those two leaders were lost. The previous leaders of the Jewish Bund were like Maidam, and uh, he wrote a few things as well that I'm seeking to get translated, together with uh, some current academic material that I'm forming up into another volume uh, on the, the political culture of the Jewish Bund as well, that's gonna be published by Pluto Press. So that's what I have in terms of archives and uh, a bit of a reference to the research, uh, the current research that's being done. Uh, there's a professor at uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax, uh, Ronnie Gajtman, who uh, writes about the uh, Bundist history. And then there's Norman Epstein, who is a Bundist here in Canada, who knows about you know, the Jewish Bund uh, here in Montreal, who's in Vancouver, who was a chemical engineer at the University of British Columbia. And then there's another Bundist academic in Australia as well that we're in contact with. So we're sort of slowly sort of, you know, finding each other and reconstituting the, uh, the archives and, uh, and uh, current academic writings, you know, on the Bund in order to bring back this uh, very important contribution to um, the Jewish political culture and also to socialist theory. Because here we have a body of theoretical writing that is socialist but not Marxist that is socialist but not Stalinist, or never was Stalinist. So it's, uh, and it also coincides with a further uh, theoretical work that was carried out by the Austrian Social Democrat leader, Otto Bauer, who wrote a doctoral thesis in 1907, published 1922, on um, nat national cultural autonomy 
and uh, social democracy. And national, national, uh, and, and national, national, social, uh, uh, autonomy in this and social, so, social, uh, democracy. That's the original name in German. And I, it's recently been translated in the year 2000 into English. It was previously translated into French in 1998. And uh, I've researched through this and I've written a paper on it. And it's going to be one of the contributions to the anthology on the Bundes uh, to be published by the Pluto Press. Excellent. So that's the uh, and background. How it relates to other members of your family, if your mother's brother was lost, as you've described it, then she and her sister would be the remaining members of her own family? Did either of them, did these politics inform their own life in any particular way? Her sister, very quiet woman, very humble, um, and she married, she went to live in Israel, and she married a survivor who came from a Russian village who told me that when he went back to his village to find out if anybody else had survived, could find nobody else. He was the only survivor of his village. He had no family left, uh, no friends, uh, no landsman, nothing. So he came to live in Israel. He met uh, Chava, my mother's sister. And uh, they had uh, two daughters. And when I was uh, having my bar mitzvah, they all came over to Toronto for my bar mitzvah. And it happened to coincide with uh, the coming of age of the first daughter, who would have